Yeah. Okay, we are live. Um, as the attendees arrive, so I'd like to welcome everyone who's arriving right now. We're going to, all the speakers are muted, and we are going to open on Facebook. All right. All righty. So, uh, without further ado, I'd like to welcome everyone tonight to this very um, important conversation. Uh, two little tidbits. Uh, this course is not COPE approved. This is not for continuing education. This is um, an important conversation and some an educational piece that is not CE credited. Um, for tonight, if you have any questions for the panelists that will be asked during the Q&A, please put them in the Q&A box. Um, any chat that you want to have either individually with the panelists and or with um, uh, me with any technical problems, put them in the chat box. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Richard Madonna. Dr. Madonna, you can go. Thank you, Betsy. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. SUNY Colleges of Optometry's Office of Continuing Professional Education has as its major goal the provision of quality postgraduate education to optometrists. Typically, this comes in the form of courses that directly relate to management of eye conditions. However, it is the college's belief that the continuing education we provide must also address matters that affect practitioners themselves and their patients. For example, we recently hosted a three-part series on COVID-19 in the optometric community that was attended by well over a thousand optometrists. Tonight, we're proud to host this important event that we hope will begin a dialogue about race and optometry that will lead to improvements in the relationship between all the members of our profession. I would now like to introduce Dr. David Heath, president of SUNY College of Optometry to begin tonight's program. Dr. Heath. Good evening, everybody, and welcome. Let, let me begin by certainly thanking Dr. Madonna and Betsy Torres uh, for sponsoring what I think is a very, very important uh, conversation that uh, not only our institution, but the entire profession and society has to have. Um, thank you as well to Dr. Shirazi and Dr. Bavenzi for stepping up and moderating this. And of course, to our panelists, Drs. Reynolds, Stanberry, uh, Glover, uh, Ramsey, Harewood. Uh, thank you so much for taking the evening uh, to spend the time with us. Um, you know, over the past uh, month or so, uh, obviously the country uh, has really been locked in on Black Lives Matter and the importance of race uh, in our society and the history of systemic uh, uh, racism. Um, that conversation, I don't personally, I've not seen this kind of uh, concentrated uh, discussion and dialogue really since uh, the 1960s and 70s after the civil rights movement uh, at that time. Uh, this is a perfect opportunity, not only for society, but for us in optometry to have similar conversations. I think everybody is aware that <clears throat> optometry has lagged behind other health professions in attracting underrepresented minorities, both black and Hispanic, um, into the fold and into the profession. It's not that we haven't said that it's a priority, but clearly whatever we have done has not worked. Um, and certainly I would say that in recent conversations, particularly with some of our black students, uh, those conversations, dialogues, and listening to the black experience is critical to our understanding and to advancing uh, the diversity uh, of the profession of optometry. So without further ado, I just really would like to thank all of you for sharing your experiences. Um, I'm planning on sitting back and listening. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Ramsey was already taking me to school even before we uh, launched the, uh, <clears throat> the uh, webinar. Uh, so I'm here to learn. Thank you very much and I hope everybody uh, gets something out of this dialogue. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Heath. Um, I'll take it from there. So. Um, so what actually are the issues uh, we want to cover today? Well, 13.4% of Americans identify as African American, but only a little over 3% of optometry students do. 1.8% of practicing optometrists 
are African American, and only 3.8% of faculty in schools and colleges of optometry are African American. So why is that? What are the reasons for this lack of representation? And we want to examine this. We want to examine the implicit biases across um, a few different categories. So first of all, what are they in schools and colleges of optometry? So what's the student experience? What are they in academ academia? What is the faculty experience? Why, why are there so few you know, black faculty in colleges of optometry? What are the implicit biases in, in industry, in the eye care industry? in private practice and business, and then also in organized optometry. So what are they in the AOA or in the American Academy of Optometry? What are the biases that lead to a lack of representation? And also, is diversity enough? You know, is diversity is really just the first step. We also need inclusivity and equality too. And I think we're gonna hear from our panelists on, on, on those issues, that's what we hope. You know, today is about identifying the problem it's about sharing and amplifying the black experience in eye care, and we wanna shed light on the issues. At a later date, we hope to have a part two where we'll really dig deep to seek solutions to the issues. But today is about sharing and amplifying that voice, which I think is so important. Um, and so I'll pass it on to Deli, who will introduce um, our panel of outstanding uh, ODs here today. Thanks, Dr. Wobenzi. Um, so the format of tonight's panel is really going to be like a question and answer, but we hope that our questions spark conversation among our panelists. And we just really want, like our title says, an honest conversation amongst all of us. So as uh, Betsy mentioned, if you have a question that you'd like to ask, please use the Q&A box and we'll do our best to monitor that throughout the evening. I'm very excited to be introducing our outstanding group of panelists this evening beginning with Dr. Daryl Glover, who is a graduate of the Pennsylvania College of Optometry and is a global optometrist, speaker, entrepreneur, and social media enthusiast. He has served the optometric community for nearly 20 years and has held every position in the field, including eyewear consultant, optometric technician, office manager, and optometrist now with My Eye Doctor. He is the co-founder of Defocus Media, Ifrica Media, and Black Eye Care Perspective, which was created to help foster lifelong relationships between Black eye care professionals. Dr. Adam Ramsey is a graduate of the Southern College of Optometry. He is the CEO of Socialite Vision, founder of Health Focus South Florida, and along with Dr. Glover, the co-founder of Black Eye Care Perspective. He is a nationally recognized speaker and lecturer and diversity and inclusion advocate. He serves on the advisory board for Bosch & Loam, Nodal Vision, Wagner Color Vision, and is a transitions change agent. Dr. Joy Harewood is a graduate of the University of California, Berkeley College of Optometry. She completed a residency in ocular disease at SUNY College of Optometry, and she's currently an attending optometrist at Bronx Care Health System, where she oversees five optometry residents and didactic education to optometry and ophthalmology residents. She has published articles in Review of Optometry, lectured at Envision New York, and presented posters at numerous Amer American Academy of Optometry meetings, and she's also a fellow of the Academy. Dr. Andre Stanbury is a graduate of the SUNY College of Optometry and went on to complete his residency in ocular disease and family practice at the East New York Diagnostic and Treatment Center. Prior to joining the faculty at the University of Waterloo, he was an assistant clinical professor at SUNY College of Optometry. He is currently a clinical associate professor and clinic director at the University of Waterloo School of Optometry and Vision Science. Dr. Cheryl Reynolds is a graduate of Nova Southeastern College of Optometry and went on to complete a residency in primary care optometry. She recently joined the faculty at Nova after being there for nearly 20 years. Prior to returning, she was an optometric liaison for your eye specialist, working alongside noted glaucoma, retina, and cornea specialists. She is a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry and the Optometric Retinal Society. She has been involved in numerous research and publications on ocular disease. Apart from her passion in academia, Dr. Reynolds serves as the current president of the National Optometric Association. You couldn't tell by her background. Um, she was the NOA Optometrist of the Year in 2013, and she serves as the chair of the Florida Optometric Association Healthy Eye Healthy People Committee and the NOA's liaison to the National Eye Institute, National Eye Health Education Program. She also serves as a volunteer member of the Prevent Blindness Scientific Advisory Committee and is heavily involved in community service. Thank you so much for all of you for being here with us this evening. So as the National Optometric Association President, Dr. Reynolds, we will begin um, the discussion with a direct 
with a question directed towards you. So please tell us a little bit about your undergraduate and optometric training experience and let us know why you think there are so few black optometry students today. Well, thank you so much again for having this conversation. It's very much needed. And thank you so much for inviting me. So again, my name is Dr. Cheryl Reynolds. And I just, before I talk about myself, I want to talk about the National Optometric Association. Um, that's important to kind of highlight our organization. So the NOA was founded in 1969. And it's interesting that it's 2020, the year of the optometrist, hindsight, current vision, and foresight. You can't look forward unless you look back. You don't know your foundation or there's a crack unless you know where we've come from. So the NOA was started in 1969 by a group of African-American doctors, our visionary leader, Dr. C. Clayton Powell, and the late Dr. John Howlett, and 25 other uh, Black optometrists. Why? The very thing that we are currently undergoing right now in 2020, the uh, longstanding pandemic of racism, inequality, hatred, and bigotry. These men were some of the first in their optometry program. They went through a very hard time. Also, too, being an optometrist at that time during the civil rights uh, era, it was hard for them to attend uh, the convention to be fully inclusive in the AOA. Uh, Dr. Powell would refer to it as taxation without representation in the sense that we paid our membership dues, but we weren't fully participant. So the NOA was born out of that to fight for diversity, inclusion, and equity. And we've been the leader in that field for over, well over 50 years, and that fight continues. Uh, not only did we form the NOA, the National Optometric Association. He was very passionate and holding the schools accountable to making sure that they accept or admit African-American, but not just African-American students, that's our passion, but diversity. And in the fight over the 50 years, we've seen an uptick in other uh, minorities in schools and op colleges of optometry. So what is the central problem today that the admittance and the rate of uh, admittance of African-American students, black students into our schools and colleges of optometry really has remained unchanged in 50 years. The number tick up a little bit, but always remain the same. So that's the challenge. So I am a 1996 graduate of Nova Southeastern University College of Optometry. And at the time I was in school, there was no African-American faculty. I was fortunate to have Dr. Terrence Ingraham, who is well known. He was one of the first, uh, he was the first black graduate of UAB. And he came on board and he became a mentor, a friend, and a guide. And he guided me through my career. And because of him is why I'm in academia. So have I experienced uh, issues of race, issues of uh, lack of equality or fairness? Yes, I have. And we'll talk about that more. But I just wanted to really expand on the NOA and let you know that part of my mission in the NOA is because we owe it to those giants that have come before us. We stand on their shoulders. And so I'm very happy and excited to be here tonight to just be part of this conversation, this very important conversation on how can we move the needle forward after 50 plus years uh, to have even more diversity, more equality, and most importantly, inclusion in the field uh, of optometry. So thank you. I actually wouldn't mind jumping in just now to say, you know, Thank you so much for introducing the organization. As a student at UC Berkeley, I didn't even know that NOA existed. I didn't know that they existed because there weren't enough black students or underrepresented minorities in our class to support an NOA chapter, you know? So when I reached SUNY and I met people like Dr. Stanberry, he was like, oh yeah, you don't know about NOA? I had absolutely no idea. And it's such a great organization. I'm really, really happy to hear much more about it. Thank you. And, and that's our goal, to increase awareness about who the NOA is. Um, we're a small organization, but we're still fighting the good fight to make sure we understand the issues and the challenges ahead. Uh, we just worked with uh, UC Berkeley on some issues of past systemic racism and rectifying that with uh, one of their first black graduate, Dr. Poston, and his family foundation to right that injustice. And we've had great conversation. I'm in the process 
process of writing most of the presidents and deans of the schools and colleges of optometry to see how we can better partner with them to address some of the issues of diversity within the faculty. We had a great town hall on Sunday night with our NOSA group. Over 100 plus people attended that town hall to hear the students' issues, complaints, experiences, and challenges. And part of that is what they brought up. You know, they would love to have more faculty. I think in addressing this, you cannot uh, answer, or you can't ignore the question of having a diverse faculty. The fact that Dr. Ingraham was my mentor and friend is why I'm a faculty at Nova Southeastern University College of Optometry. He really guided me, he encouraged me, and told me that I could do it. And uh, I came on and then uh, unfortunately he passed away a year later. So I felt like I stepped into a, a really big shoe of a giant person uh, to make sure that I continue to be there for those students that come through the program. And over my 20 years at Nova Southeastern, it's been pretty rewarding to be there for those students and to hear their challenges and complaints. So. We're taking some steps at the NOA. One of our things that we're going to do, and hopefully with uh, SUNY and with uh, Black Eye Care Perspective, is mentorship. I think one of the biggest ways to address uh, faculty member, uh, Black faculty or diversity within the faculty is mentorship. That, as I said, Dr. Ingraham was my mentor. Because um, academia is hard. It's not always easy dealing with these millennial students and uh, it's a bit of a challenge, but it's rewarding nonetheless. And I've been doing it for over 20 odd years. And uh, some of my students are on this uh, panel uh, watching right now. And I'm so proud that they've graduated and they can contribute to uh, the profession of optometry and their community at large. So. Dr. Harewood, I just wanted to kind of get your perspective on how maybe your experience would have been different if you did have more black mentors in optometry. Well, great question. Again, thank you for picking up this panel. Um, I want to circle back to talk about my experience as a black student at in optometry school. Um, I went to UC Berkeley because it provided me the quickest access to clinic and a really strong didactic program. And I was really interested in that, which is great. Um, and thankfully there was one other black student in my class, which was like a major coup d'etat because most of the time there's not. What was infuriating though, is I was constantly mistaken for her. And if I can just talk about my friend and beautiful Cheryl Guillory Reeves, you know, she was about four inches taller than me. She had long locks. She had a Bay Area drawl. I'm five foot three. I am from Ottawa, Canada, even the suburbs of Ottawa, Canada, and I sound like this. So clearly, there's no way we look like each other. You know, I can speak about you know my big sib, who said I was one of the good ones, or may have said things like comparing me to Fresh Prince or whoever she'd seen on TV. I can speak about you know some of the more harrowing and less funny and jovial experiences that I had as an extern. Um, one particular experience, I actually relayed this to um, my five amazing Bronx Care residents during a lecture the other day, how I had this absolutely harrowing traffic stop when I was an extern in um, Albuquerque, the Albuquerque VA, and how I really thought I was gonna be a hashtag and I got myself out of that experience by explaining to the police officer how Engie's misdiagnosis works. I mean, there are endless, endless things that I could say. In terms of having the NOA or somebody like that in my corner, it would serve as an advocate or even a safe space, somewhere to talk to, someone to have that type of, you know, camaraderie or to say, you know, this is an avenue you should take. This is a mental health space that you can use or even these are resources or opportunities that you could have, you know, that type of thing is invaluable when you are one of the only. I don't know if anybody else can, on the panel can speak about some of their experiences as a Black person, a Black student in October. I think, I think, I think Joy, um, and thanks everyone. Thanks um, uh, to SUNY and Matthew and Delhi and um, Dr. Madonna and Dr. Heath for getting us all together. I think it's really important to have this conversation and I think it's very timely. I think in some ways it's overdue. Um, so I echo a lot of the things that you said, Joy. Um, I attended SUNY and um, my first day at school, I remember 
orientation was complete. I remember walking into the cafeteria. I remember being surrounded by some of the upper year black students and they said, you have to understand some things. <laughs> you know, many of, us, many, of, many of the people that look like you that attend this program don't graduate or they fail to graduate on time, right? So I remember sitting down, I remember thinking about it, like, wow, this is interesting. My first day here, this is what I'm presented with. And in thinking about that over the years, I tried to present or to talk with other students or mentor other students as well. In fact, one of my um, classmates, Erica Otu, who I'm still pretty close with right now, we had a conversation about it and said, you know, we have to ensure that this is not us, right? So we had that support, that individual support. Um, because of that, I joined the uh, joined NOSA, the student chapter of the NOA, and became president of, um, of NOSA while I was there. And a big part of what I wanted to do was to mentor some of the other students as they went through the program. Also, some of the things that we noticed is that, um, especially when it came to subjective assessments, um, some of the students had complaints that perhaps they weren't graded as fairly. Things that related to case history, perhaps things that weren't as objective as um, maybe an IOP finding or something else, that uh, they didn't feel as if they were graded as fairly as some of the other students. And, you know, so what we did would bring them in, we'd assess them, and many times we found the students were excellent at doing what they, they needed to do. Um, so there was definitely a dis discrepancy that existed. And I think one of the main things, as you mentioned, the freshman's comment and so on, as you're going through the program, it's about being othered. It's about being the person that's only, you're the only one. And much of the time I was at SUNY, I was the only black male student that was there. So when I came in the first year, we had a black male student who was on externships in his fourth year. When I was in my fourth year, the other black male students came, came into, into the first year as well. So going through it, you have the interactions and many of the interactions I had um, with other students for the first year and a half, two years I was there, a lot of people mistook me for staff, right? So I was in the elevators. I remember once asking about, um, about the board exams. I said, uh, board exams are coming up, uh, you know, what was it like? You just took it, you know, how is it? And the response was sort of, um, well, your staff, why does it really matter to you? I was already in school for almost two years at that point. So, you know, so we had these experiences you go through and I think it's always battling, optometry school is difficult as it is, but it's also the challenge of being the only or the other person that's going through the program. So I think support, I think the idea of representation can't be understated. Representation is really, really important. Um, Dr. Reynolds mentioned that I think um, having somebody who is, has perhaps similar lived experience to yourself, it's really valuable. You believe that you can become what you see. Um, without seeing that example of what you can become, it's really difficult. And at times it may not feel as if it's for you. And I think this expands. Now, once you're already in optometry school, that's 90% of the battle. But what about uh, people in the community who've never seen a black optometrist? This child who doesn't realize that they can actually aspire to become an optometrist. What's the path? Who would I talk to about this? This is for somebody else, you know? So I think these things are all important, but we'll get into those, those components a bit farther. But I think my experience, uh, Joy, I think is very similar to what you've had, where it's a very isolating experience. You do have to find comfort in other ways to motivate yourself. You do have to um, find refuge in organizations and perhaps others who are in the program as well too, to be able to pull yourself through. I don't know if Dr. Glover or Dr. Ramsey, if anyone else wanted to comment before we ask. Dr. Ramsey, do I get the floor, man, or what? I get it? Okay, thank you, sir. Greetings, everyone. It's your favorite optometrist, Dr. Daryl Glover. If you didn't know that, now you know. I want to break down what Black Eye Care Perspective is before we get into just a little bit of my history at PCO. And shout out to PCO as well. Um, Black Eye Care Perspective was created by myself and Dr. Adam Ramsey. And um, it was created to really create authentic dialogue between African Americans and the entire eye care industry. And this organization was designed strictly for black eye care professionals because we felt like we needed a place where we could just talk solely amongst each other and also come together and talk to the industry about problems that we see and that we encounter. Um, our goal or our three-prong approach that we're tackling with our organization is really to, number one, increase um, more awareness of the biases that take place on the executive level because Nothing's going to move, nothing's going to change unless we are up top and we're sitting in those rooms, whether it's a boardroom or executive, to really make those decisions to make things take place. Number two, we really wanted to work with companies and other eye care professionals to make sure that their values align with, um, you know, equity and inclusion and things of that nature as well. And then lastly, we really wanted to be able to have uh, better dialogue um, with our uh, colleagues and also work with non-minority eye care professionals that work in heavily populated black areas, um, just to you know, give them a few more tips in regards to 
um, how to communicate better with the black eye, or excuse me, a black population, black demographic. All of us are great as optometrists. We all know how to find sickle cell retinopathy, diabetic retinopathy, hypertensive ret retinopathy. But sometimes there's certain ways to communicate that message to a black person so they can actually take that information in and understand it. And then we also just wanted to make sure not just the dialogue, but also the right resources are in these offices to help grow that practice and make a black face feel welcome when they walk into that office. Um, I had the opportunity of going to PCO and I chose PCO specifically because they had the largest black population. Not enough, but they had the largest. On top of that, they had a black dean, Dean Horn. Dean Horn was my man. Dean Horn, because of him, that is one reason why I was able to make it through school. Um, in addition to all the other colleagues that I got to see that looked like me. Um, going through PCO, um, it was a challenge. There's no, there's no doubt about it. I mean, before I even got into optometry school to see if I could even make it through the work, I actually had to do the summer enrichment program there. And I was able to do that and knock it out. Um, at PCO, I was also a member of the NOA or NOSA at the time. And I also was a president at NOSA. So I really enjoyed myself and all the things that the NOA provided for me as a student. Um, and um, as a student, the one thing that I could say was difficult initially until, you know, you got to just flex your muscles and take advantage uh, and just do what you got to do is really, you know, getting the resources for tests, whether they were past tests or, um, you know, those things that other students get passed down that may not get passed down to that black uh, community. So um, overall, my experience at PCO um, I enjoyed it. I wanted to see more black people because they've been pretty stagnant. It's always anywhere between eight to about 11 black students, or I think last I heard six to 11. So there's been really no change. Um, just because they have more than other schools doesn't mean that that's just super great. We still need to see an increase because we're hitting that flat line when it comes to students. Uh, but personally, I think the real issue when it comes to blacks and eye care is really the pipeline. Uh, we need to do a better job when it comes to the pipeline. And um, as Andre mentioned, I know we're going to get into that a little later, uh, but I just wanted to give my perspective, tell you guys what Black Eye Care perspective is, and um, shout out to PCO, but we can do better, all right? I know the president is listening as well. Dr. Ramsey, what's going on, man? I know you got something to say. You've been quiet too long on this, man. I'm, I'm good, man. I'm, in, I'm enjoying the other panelists here. Thanks for SUNY putting this on. Um, you know, Dr., Dr. Glover and I were sitting down a few weeks ago and we're sitting back and we're hearing the, the conversations going on about George Floyd and all the stuff that was happening. And I heard so many colleagues say, you know, oh, that's going on there, but you know, what does that have to do with this? And what, I, what me and uh, Dr. Glover talked about was, I don't think they understand that what is happening there happens in eye care. And we decided, you know, we're gonna put out a video and say, show you guys that I could be George Floyd. I could be Trayvon Martin. Because so many people say, well, you're not one of those black people. That's, what, that's, that, that's the conversations that we hear. And I'm trying to figure out what do you mean by those black people? So I say, you know what? I need to talk to my other black colleagues and let them tell their story about race in America so they can realize that on the side of the road, they don't know my profession. They don't know what I do for a living. I could be standing anywhere and die here in America. So even in eye care, the, these black doctors have real issues. And that's why we, you know, we put that out uh, to begin. You know, when I got into, I went to SEO and I show up on campus the first day only to realize I was the only black, black male student in the whole school, all the way up, freshman to senior. So I'm like, it's just me. There's nobody. There's nobody else I can talk to. And you know, even though, and, and th that that's where I really feel that you have to have a targeted approach. And your first initial question um, was, you know, what is the issue? And I, our belief and why we started Black Eye Care Perspective was that if you only talk about underrepresented minorities, all the time Black people get left behind. We get lost in the sauce. You can't find us because if you talk about underrepresented minorities, every underrepresented minorities has gone up. So a lot of people are patting themselves on the back because it's gone up. Hispanics have went from five to 10% in the last 10 years. Asians have went up to 30%, right? So if you it went from 24 to 30%. So if you look at underrepresented minorities as a group, you will say, we are doing a great job. 
But if you break it out and you see that African Americans have been at three and stayed at three, you will realize that no, you have been doing a jo good job for others. But if you do not have a targeted approach for black people, you will not reach us. The issues that affect our community are different. You cannot, rising tide does not lift all boats. Some boats have holes in it. Some people don't got a boat. So you have to say, what is the issues here? And I am going to fix and I'm going to address this. And I've used this analogy before, but when we had 10% women in eye care, we got, they got together and said, we're going to have a plan to get more women to love this profession. And we go from 10% to 70%. But if I would ask a school, if I would ask ASCO, what is your plan for black people? Their response is, we're working on underrepresented minorities. We're working on black and brown. Hold on, I didn't ask you about black and brown. I said black people. Because if you say black and brown, the chart will look good because of the brown. It won't look good because of the black. So I'm asking you, what is your plan for black people? And they will stop and say, well, we don't have a plan. Well, no wonder it's not working. You do not have a plan. So our, our goal is to say, hey, I, I, I want everybody to succeed. But we got to realize that one group here is being left out with the plan that's been going on for the last 50 years. So we need a plan right here. And then when, when all of us get caught up to, uh, you know, when, when we get caught up, then we can start going back talking about underrepresented minorities. But while the, this one group is staying like this and everybody else is getting better, we need to have a targeted plan and say, hold on, I'm getting left behind right here with the plan that is underrepresented minority plan of action. So uh, I'm happy that uh, SUNY decided to put this panel on um, and we need more. And I'm excited to hear from the other panelists as well. Something, one thing I do want to say, I'm sorry, Dr. Glover. Yeah. I want to really seize upon that point because I think it's vitally important, not just for black students. There is no, di there is no excellence without diversity. There is no excellence without diversity and not only is it good for black students, it's good for the entire class. There's data to suggest that when you have a diverse class, there are different voices, there are different questions that are asked. People actually feel like they get a richer experience. Everybody wins when you have a diverse class. There's questions I would ask or experiences that I have that other people would not have, you know? So, you know, people talk about diversity buying your portfolio. Diversify your class, you know, diversify your life and you will be surprised at how how much better everything is, how much more excellent, how much higher we can rise. Um, Dr. Glover, I will see the floor. Yeah, no, I mean, you bring up a great point. I mean, studies have shown that if you have a diverse uh, committee or a diverse group, you know, they're gonna perform 35% better than a non-diverse group. So, I mean, I'm, I'm with you with that 100%. Um, you know, just going back to what Dr. Ramsey was touching on, I mean, one of the major issues is that when these folks, uh, ASCO schools or whoever are having these conversations, you need to invite the NOA, Black Eye Care Perspective. You need to have Black folks. Who else is going to attract Black folks better than Black folks? I mean, you can't have a room of folks that do not resemble what you're trying to attract because you're not going to know exactly what's going to work for them. So that's why there's the NOA. That's why it's Black Eye Care Perspective. We can work with the different organizations, whether it's ASCO or the schools individually, to really change this game because this is something that is needed and this is the time to make it happen right now. Um, I love optometry and I love when students come into my office and they wanna learn more about it, whether they're black, brown, purple, or yellow. But when a black child sees a black optometrist, sometimes it's the first time they've ever seen a black doctor and that is so impactful and it's so huge and it moves the child to want to be something bigger and greater and better than what they ever thought they could be. So we need to do a better job. And as everyone has mentioned, I'm so happy that SUNY has put this together, but I don't want to just create awareness. I want to really make sure that, you know, whether it's the next episode or whatever it may be, that we really talk about actionable uh, things that we could do to change the game. Because we could talk until we blew in the face, but if we're not doing something about this, then this is pointless. And let me just add, I want to agree. So uh, one of the things I would just want to say that diversity is critically important. I agree with Joy that uh, you, you can only have a successful profession, successful workforce, successful schooling of the students, just success all around with diversity. And the NOA has been committed to that. Let me just add a little bit about some historical 
perspective, because one of the issues is Daryl brought up is action behind it. We can talk diversity, and the definition of that is having a difference, uh, a presence of difference within a given setting. One person of color is not diversity, and that has been the challenge that has been, uh, or what the, the status quo has been. It's been one black student, one, you know, whatever. My point is you just having one is not diversity. You need to have a diverse work group. But it's not just the diversity. You know, Dean Horn at PCO did an amazing job working with the NOA. That was a federally funded program to bring those students in during the summer. When I graduated in 1996, I remember meeting colleagues and friends from PCO. There were 15 in a class uh, of Blacks in a class. I, they had the largest amount. Dr. Ed Marshall has worked tirelessly uh, with ASCO. And I remember his program at Indiana. And his program at Indiana worked. So there are models that show that there can be success in certain programs. For example, his model, he went around, uh, he really uh, addressed the HBCUs, which we'll talk about, um, and that's one of the NOA's initiative, and he really formed a relationship. With those schools, one of the challenges is that there, there's a fight for all of them in different forms of healthcare, medicine, and different fields, so you really have to cultivate that relationship. And Dr. Ed Marshall did a stellar job, and he recruited it from Mississippi, people went to Indiana, probably never saw snow and went to Indiana and most of our NOA members uh, that have graduated from that program are from that program. So there were targeted program that really worked that we know works uh, to help increase uh, you know, African American students, black students into the schools and colleges of optometry. I also want to share a little bit of my experience. I uh, graduated in 1996. I remember when I got accepted, it was all about affirmative action. You only got here because of affirmative action, Dr. Reynolds. That's the only reason you're here. Affirmative action. And the biggest benefactors of affirmative action have been white women, per se. And I had to fight against that. I always had to prove myself. I always had to do twice as better in the clinical setting. I had to do better on a test. I had to show myself, and I think that's the challenge too. Not only are you the only one sometimes in the class, but you have to go above and beyond to prove that you're worthy. And as we talk about optometry, we talk about the beginning and the pipeline, even within the profession, as, as Daryl said, you know, the boardroom, even lecturing is a constant fight to prove that you're just as good to be on faculty, to be a CE speaker, to be a key opinion leaders um, in industry, or to be on leadership team at these various organizations, American Optometric Association, or even Academy. And I know the work is a challenge, but is you have to prove yourself, and I don't think that's fair. That's one of the things that I always thought as a, as a student, as an optometrist for over 20 years, I'm not proving myself, I know I could do it, but why do I feel that I have to prove myself? That's always a big challenge for us as, as black optometrists and that sometimes can be burdensome as well. I'll give you, I'll give you an example of me practicing. You know, I, I went into the office and you know, typically pre-COVID, when I go to work, I look like Mr. GQ. I'm dressed up, suit, you know, fly, you know, just I'm going there because I like to look good because I feel like when I look good, I'm gonna perform at the top level. And there was a time I went into the office and I'm sitting there reviewing the charts and a person comes in, it was actually another doctor, and they asked me, are you my tech for today? And I'm sitting here thinking, I'm dressed down and in a suit, hard bottoms on, and have a tablet in my hand, the same tablet that you use, and you're gonna ask me if I'm your technician today. I mean, that's crazy. Uh, to give you another example of people just not thinking that, you know, black eye care professionals can actually do what they can do and we do it great. I had a time last year where I was in the office and a Caucasian guy came in, an older guy, and um, I was coming out and I was doing a doctor patient handoff, educating my team and educating the patient on, you know, what they needed to make their lifestyle better and give them all the solutions that they needed. And this gentleman saw me and he said, hey, is that my doctor? That black man right there, is that my doctor? And they said, yes, that's Dr. Glover. He's uh, the, one of the greatest doctors in our practice, if not the best. And um, that guy said, I do not want to see a black doctor. Give me a white doctor. I don't want to see a doctor. Keep in mind, there's people all in the building and all that other jazz. And these are the things that we have to deal with day in and day out. 
you know, and it's, it's not right. You know, we should be able to be on the same playing field as everyone else and um, be able to have the same opportunities as everyone else. Um, just because of my skin tone doesn't mean that I'm not uh, knowledgeable and I have what it takes to be a great optometrist. Um, but, you know, just giving you a few touch points in regards to what we have to deal with day in and day out. But I could talk for days about this. Yeah, and I think I think I think Daryl, thanks for sharing that. Uh, that's not, and again, that's an important point, and that's something. Unfortunately, it's not it's not such a unique thing as a black um, eye doc, right? So, I echo very similar experiences as what you've had. And I think going back to the idea of having a diverse class, um, diversity not only helps you while you're in the school setting, but I think when you're out in practice, the ability to have representation within the community, to have those connections. One of the things that happened when I was in school. When I had patients that were black, automatically they're very excited to see you. Like, wow, are you my, are you my, are you the student that's working with me today? You know, and they're very excited about it. They're very compliant. They want to make sure that you um, that they performed well as a patient for you in a way. Um, so I think out in the public to pr to provide culturally competent care is very very important. Um, so to have representation, as you mentioned when we started, Matt, about the the demographics of optometrists and the and the the, the population in the United States. And I should add very similar situation in Canada as well too. It's not any, any different here. It's important that, that we can actually provide culturally competent care by having a, a, a population of docs that represent the, the, the actual population so that when you go out, you don't run into those circumstances. Perhaps that gentleman that Daryl interacted with, you would have been the first doctor that would have served them. He'd have seen that over and over and over again. So I think this idea of representation and being present and being there and having people um, that, that represent the rainbow of individuals across the, um, the US and Canada and elsewhere. It's so important to, to, to get rid of racism as it exists or reduce the, the amount of racism as it exists, but also to empower um, others to pursue other professions as was mentioned before and to, to provide patients who belong to, to those various groups um, access to individuals that look like them, <laughs> you know, so we can actually start building that up and so that patients feel a level of comfort when they're in with their, with their eye doctor as well. So I, I think diversity, we spoke about in the school context, but I do think it's important to think about it also just in the general context and what that means for care. I think it does improve care delivery um, as well as education, as what Joy had mentioned previously. And, and Daryl, I will say, oh, sorry. <laughs> same thing happened to me. I was mistaken for the, the registrar last week, and I've been working in the same clinic forever. You know, so it's it's definitely not unique. I worked for several years in Staten Island. And even though I work in New York City, and New York City is the most diverse metropolitan area, Staten Island is the most, it's, it's the Republican, it's a very conservative place. So crossing over into that island is like crossing 50 years back. Um, so the idea of culturally competent care, as Andre was saying, is inc incredibly important because people were able to share certain things with me that they didn't share with others. Yeah. Her status to show that um, black doctors who speak with black patients tend to write more notes. They tend to connect more, especially in a community that has a historic mistrust of medicine for good reason, you know? So, and again, I'll see the floor. Sorry, Dr. Love. Well, all I was going to add was that, you know, by 2050, you know, half of the United States is going to be uh, minorities. It's going to be the new majority. So if we don't actually accept diversity and we don't have that reflected in our practice, then we're going to do a disservice to our patients. So we need to be able to communicate and we also need to make sure our office and our profession reflects what we see because we need to be able to communicate with patients just like you were saying, Joy. There was a there's a comment from one of the um, attendees that I that I wanted to bring up and, and ask you all about. It's from a, a second year student at um, at IAU uh, Puerto Rico, and uh, she commented about how she was at an AOA conference and there was out of all the lecturers, over fifty plus lecturers, not one was black. And uh, you know AOA Academy, they often get their lecturers from schools and colleges of optometry, so faculty members. So that, that probably goes to, you know, the lack of diversity among faculty. What challenges, those of you who are on faculty at various schools and colleges or, or who have been attending uh, for, before, um, what challenges do you face as faculty members and why are there so few faculty at, at the schools? 
especially because, you know, the, uh, Dr. Glover, you mentioned how one of the reasons you went to PCO, not only was it the, the student representation of, of African Americans, but also you, you mentioned the dean there was black. So I assume, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that, that one of the things that attracts black students would be black faculty. And so how do we attract more black faculty? Why are there issues there? You know, being a faculty member at NOVA for over 20 years, I, I may want to, to shed some, it's challenging, right? So at first it was a pay issue. So there's always this uh, challenge of if you go out into the real world, you'll make more money. So also too, uh, there was a residency trained. Uh, so we, let's start with that. So you have your optometry students and then after optometry school, most students go into private practice or some practice mode. And then there are those that do residency and not a lot of black students do residency. In my years at Nova Southeastern, I've seen some of my great students do residency, but then the challenge could also be just cost of living. You know, these students are coming out with a higher debt load than ever before. Um, and so part of that could be economic but the biggest issue is mentorship. I, like I said before, I said it earlier, Dr. Terrence Ingraham was one of my greatest mentors. And it was because of his encouragement, because even after I did my residency um, in optometry, I opened up a private practice. So I had a fork in the road moment after three years in private practice. And uh, teaching has been a passion of mine, even when I left to practice with the glaucoma specialist, I came back to teaching because it's been a passion of mine. But it's, you know, I think what we need to do with our African American students or black students uh, is to mentor them. I think the biggest issue is mentorship. But I want to touch on what your uh, the chat box said about uh, industry and our profession. And when we talk about diversity, that's a great talk. It's a talking point, right? We talk about diversity, but we really need to really look at that. It takes work. It, it takes work, effort, and work to really make the profession more diverse. I think we've done a a good job over the years, as that I think uh, Adam brought up, we've moved the needle when it comes to Asian Americans, we've moved the needle when it comes to Hispanic, but African and Black uh, individuals are consistently behind the eight ball. So I agree that we need to focus on Black. And that would be the thing about diversity. But diversity is important, but so is inclusion. Inclusion in my profession, the profession I chose to study for four years and to be part of is also the biggest challenge. So when you talked about CE and seeing CE speakers that look like the patient demographic, um, you don't see that quite a bit. It's such a challenge to be part of that uh, world. And I have to tell you, I've been practicing for 18 years working at NOVA. I've submitted lectures. I've submitted lectures. I've lectured. I think I speak well. But it's a very hard nut to crack that we still have to fight to crack. And I think Daryl brought up, it starts in the boardroom with some of these uh, key uh, leaders, uh, because even the KOLs, the key, or the key opinion leaders that they have for industry, I mean, think about it, diabetes. Who disproportionately is impacted from diabetes? Black and brown people. Who disproportionately go blind from glaucoma? Black and brown people. Our population is so diverse that we need to have the diversity. But when I go back, again, it's inclusion. And, and inclusion, the definition of that, I had to look that up a little bit myself. It's feeling valued. It's feeling welcomed. And when I go to the AOA, I don't feel welcome. Maybe that's why I haven't been to the AOA in a very long time. There's very few people that look like me in the exhibit, the sponsorship hall, and, and you know, uh, lecturing about diseases that disproportionately impact black and brown people. Daryl, I, 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 I just wanted to say one thing, it, you know, what you just touched on. Look at the, the, uh, the, the board, the executive team of the AOA. What do you see? There's no diversity there at all. So you brought up a great point. I mean, that's the top of the top. If there's no diversity there, how do we expect for it to trickle down? I mean, it starts from up there. and We really need to hone in on that area and see a change. And it's the year of vision, 2020. We can make it happen. Let's start this year and make it happen. But you brought up a great point. I mean, that's, that's, that's the key. Yeah, yeah. And again, being valued and included in the profession, that's what it really says when you have a diverse speaking uh, panel. Now, you know, when you submit your lectures, it's a name, it's a lecture. 
you know, I don't know what else there is, but I know that some names are well known than others, but that's part of that. And then equity, Ma making sure that we have equity. We talk about diversity, but inclusion, again, is so critically important, being valued, being part of that optometric community. But equity is critically important. And that's where I feel equal to anyone, to you, Matt, to anyone in the optometric profession, and that's what we don't have. So we have more African Americans, we have more Asian Americans, we have more uh, Hispanics. We got to work in our African American. I agree with Black Perspective, and that's a focus that we need to have. But when you talk about equity, there's no equity. There's still, after all these years, there's still no equity uh, within the profession, and those are some of the challenges. That's what some of the things we want to talk about tonight. So uh, thank you. Everybody's been doing a really good job here. So um, after we put out the video, the response we got back was, but what now? And I think that's what the issue has been, is that we have to clearly articulate what the problem is and clearly articulate the solutions that people can receive. Not that we haven't been saying it, because you can go back, and I went on the websites, and you can see the plans, and there's pages and pages of task force this and diversity inclusion board that and blah, 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 blah. So the information has been there. What we wanted to put out and what we put out last week was the 13% promise in which we want companies, organizations, schools to sign up and say that they're committed to getting the bar at 13%. And after we put that out, we got contacted by a few people. And what they said to us was, Thank you for giving us a bar. Because when you look at the numbers, if the amount of practicing optometrists are 1.8%, they were evaluating their company saying, well, we have more than 1.8% African Americans in my company, so I am doing a good job. And the issue was they did not know where to put the bar. And we told them, hold up, that 1.8% is not it. That's the problem. The, we want to get to minimum of 13%. And we want you to commit to reaching to that number. And then they said, well, we can't do that. We, I said, well, you need to then push on the ones that you can. Put the influence where it needs. Put, apply the pressure to get people to say, this is the bar. This is when we would say, all right, we have the diversity now. Let's make sure we have the inclusion. Right, because you can't have you can't have inclusion without without having a diversity first. And after you have that a diverse uh, team, then you can say, okay, are we making it inclusive? But we have to have enough people there, like Dr. Reynolds is saying. If you don't have enough students and have and that small amount barely does a few residencies, then you won't get the faculty. So at the end of the day, the the issue that we have is that you have to get more volume of students. So the 1.8, we are setting the bar at 13%, 13% of students. We want 13% of faculty. We want 13% of your executive boards. So when I clicked on and I went on all the school's websites, very few had even one black person on their board, not one. So if you have graduated 100 black optometrists in the last 100 years, are you telling me not one deserved to be on your board? That is the problem. When, when I went and I signed up, and I threw my name in the hat to be a KOL and a speaker. Almost every single one, I'm, I'm a KOL for five companies now. I was the first black person for all of them. How in 2019 are you telling me, little old Adam me, without no fellowship, without no residency, nothing is the first black person y'all could find that could get on these boards? That is the issue. If you have no diversity at the top, if that's not, if that's not more than just your slogan or a marketing company put together a little packet on diversity and inclusion, and, and we say that we're about this. If you don't have that, how can you do it? We ask them to say, hey, we want you to give 13% of your donations to black uh, uh, nonprofits and for-profit companies that are owned and run by black people so that we can get the funds and the resources because we have organizations like the National Optometry Association. If we were to flood 13% of the money that was already given, we weren't asking them to give more than they were normally given. We're saying if you give a million dollars last year away to nonprofits, how many went to black people and black organizations? And almost, we've talked to about, about, well, about a dozen companies, Daryl, in the past week. Almost none. You tell me, so you gave a million dollars last year away 
and you gave nothing to black people, that is the core of the problem. And when we talk, literally when we talk to them, they're like, I didn't even think about it. It did not even cross my mind. I didn't realize. And I was like, yes, that is the issue. We need to set a bar. So we have a bar, a number that is out there, Black Eye Care Perspective slash the 13% 13, uh, 13 promise. And you can see listed out exactly where we are. We want people to sign up and say, this is where the new bar is. Evaluate and self-evaluate yourself and then say, okay, we're here. And how can we help increase the pipeline so that we have more students, so we have more Black faculty, so that we have more people on the board and go back and look because we don't want to call people out. We want you to fix it yourself, see it. And I want to see next week, next month, all of a sudden, Joy's on the board, Andre's on the board. There are great qualified, Cheryl's on the board. We got a lot of great qualified people that are here that you have to add, that you have to add. Because a lot of times people think racism is the, is, is the issue, but it's more nepotism. It's not really racism so much. It is the fact that I don't know a lot of black people, so I pull up the person I, I, I know. Well, hold on, make, make, have a conversation. Talk with people, find out, ask them for the resume. All of a sudden you're like, oh, you've done all that, Dr. Reynolds? I did not know you did all that. Oh, maybe we need to think again. But the problem is you never ask. And, and, and that's where the conversation is not happening and they are inviting to see speakers that they know, nepotism. It isn't racism. I don't think they're racist against individual people, but the nepotism is, is making it look bad in the profession and that's why we wanted to highlight and, and shout from the rooftops and say, hold on, y'all. Don't think like y'all, this house ain't got nothing to need to get cleaned up. Let's not act like I care is perfect over here. Let's get our house in order. I think that that's vitally important to say because 88% of those at the upper echelon, so the distinguished teaching faculty, 88% in optometry are white males, 88%. <laughs> so. It's exactly what you're saying. You pull up, people tend to hire people that look like them. Mm -hmm. There's data that suggests that people tend to help people who look like them. You know, if I think of some spaces that I've been fortunate to be in, it's because somebody like Dr. Madonna knows me and is like, hey, Joy, why don't you do this? Or, you know, my mentor, Dr. Richter, is like, hey, Joy, why don't you do this? Or somebody like, you know, Dr. Sam Barry Andre says, oh, yeah, I'm doing this. So we need, you know, you don't get, being successful or getting a measure of success is bringing somebody else up behind you. And people like ourselves need to bring other people up behind us to make space for us all. Yeah, and, and I, I agree entirely. I think um, Dr. Ramsey, Harewood, um, you guys make excellent points about, about this. So I think a part of it is building the pipeline to what I said before. So I agree with that. The bigger the pipeline, the more people you're gonna have that will go into these varied areas. But another important point that we touched on when we began the discussion is about inclusion. So as you have students going through the program, um, many of the students who are going through the program, they don't feel included from when they're in school. So that thought of actually staying on and becoming faculty or doing a residency, is just I need to kind of move on and get ahead with my life. I don't need to be here within this environment where I don't feel a part of the, the structure. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the things that the schools can do more immediately is to um, take, take steps, make effort to ensure the students feel more included as part of the, the student body. And I think what will happen, even though there may be a disproportionately small uh, number of um, black students there, you might find that there may be a disproportionately more black students going into faculty or, ex or exploring those options nonetheless, because it's just not feeling a connection with the environment that you're in that's so, so key. So that also, in addition to building a pipeline, you need to, we need to work on those elements as well. And, you know, I agree because being at NOVA for so long, you know, part of it, I was the only black faculty for many years, many years. But what NOVA did that really helped me was I had great mentors that didn't look like me, but also to the school, you had uh, people that were African American in the medical program and in the dental program, and we formed our own little support network with each other because they were challenged as well. So that inclusion part is so critically important. If the students don't feel included, and we just had our NOA, NOSA Town Hall meeting, and that's one of the resounding themes of the students. Even now in 2020, a lot of the students don't feel as inclusive in their schools and colleges of optometry as they should be. Uh, they feel that, you know, I, I think Daryl brought up or Adam brought up the old tests or old material, or just even in a lab group and studying, um, or they feel treated differently by preceptors and not having a voice or concern to express their 
you know, their issues, you know, and, and a lot of times their issues are, oh, it's just, okay, we'll take care of it. And it's not really taken care of. And I think, you know, we talk about educating, not just the public here today, but the schools and colleges need to do a better a job at teaching cultural competency, diversity initiative, because it's not for me to talk, but I, I can do only do so much talking. We need to have programs that really help our faculty members and not just our faculty members, our students too. You have some students who've never really been around a black person before or um, anything like that. So, and even experiencing a black patient, you know, if you come from, you know, South Dakota, I don't know how many black patients or, you know, you might have seen or will see, but here in South Florida, uh, you know, you know, all the patients, nine out of 10 are African American, specifically down here in South Florida. So even cultural competency when it comes to that. But I agree with you, Andre, inclusion at the schools and colleges where it's at, and also to mentorship. Uh, Joy hit the nail on the head. If you have a good mentor, um, and, and that's part of the reason I've been in faculty for a very long time. And I'm proud to say that Nova Southeastern now has about three, I think four or five uh, black faculty, no, five black faculty, including myself. So we're proud of that, but other schools, and I hate when they say they can't find a good black faculty, you know, because there are candidates out there, they're just not looking. Or as Adam said, when they talk about key opinion leaders, they've always been there. I'm pretty sure they know there's a lot of awesome, you know, graduated black faculty that have been doing awesome and amazing work. So when they say they can't find one, it's always the excuse, we can't find one, no one's really interested. You gotta recruit, you gotta recruit. And they're, they're out there, there's a lot of young, dynamic, African-American students doing residencies that again, maybe don't feel included, so they go into uh, private practice. But if you recruit them, they'll come to your schools and colleges of optometry. You know, I should say this point as well too. Um, we're talking about faculty who are optometrists. Well, mm -hmm. let's understand that we have a number of faculty members in the schools that are exactly. basic science researchers and, and other people. And outside of even folks that are related to education, you have administrators as well too. So. There's opportunities to hire individuals uh, within different parts of the school. So it doesn't have to be just the clinical faculty. It can be research faculty, it could be other administrators as well. But I think um, we, we talk about representation and I think, um, I think we understand in the panel what that, what that really means. But I, I just share just a personal story of mine. So I was born in Jamaica and in Jamaica when I was growing up, um, you know, a lot of the people look just like me. So over 90% of people look like me. I went to school, my principal looked just like me. I went to the dentist, my dentist looked like me. I went to the doctor, the doctor looked like me. There was never a thought that I couldn't become them, right? That was never a barrier to say, I can't do that. Um, it really depended most on my aptitude and my interest, right? Now, years later, I moved to Canada. When I moved to Canada and interacted with some, uh, my friends here, black people in school and high school, I felt the difference where they never interacted with people that looked like them. So when, I, when you came, your dentist didn't look like you, your doctor didn't look like you, the principal didn't look like you, the teachers looked nothing like you. So from their perspective, these things weren't for them, right? So I know we've, we've talked about sort of this idea of representation in a general sense, but I think that provides sort of a concrete context of what it means. So, you know, for me, um, as I was going through my formative years, I believed I could be whatever I wanted to be. Um, but if you're in a society where no one looks like you, you watch news, nobody looks like you, it's really difficult for you to aspire to become something that you don't see represented. So I think this idea of inclusion, it's not really abstract. This idea of representation is not so abstract. It's a real thing. It's a real tangible thing. And it, it is quite powerful. So the more efforts that schools can, um, can do to actually put people in these, in these positions, um, I think it will pay a lot of dividends. You can't look for success in these instances as say next year, what does it look like? I think this is the long game. I think you have to look at change in the culture and you have to look at the students that are coming up from grade school, you know, elementary school, high school, and getting those students into the pipeline. So this is some, this is, you know, five, 10 year plans, not necessarily what's going to happen next year. So success um, from these discussions, I think it's something that we'll see in, you know, in a number of years from now, but I think it's well worth the investment for many of the reasons that we discussed earlier. I do just want to jump in and address that, that we have a lot of wonderful questions in the, the Q&A right now. A lot of them are asking specifically about solutions. So I just wanted to let our audience members know that we are going to be saving this chat and we're going to be addressing the solutions in part two. 
But there was a really good question that came in that kind of goes into what Dr. Stanberry was just saying. So what motivated many of you to want to join the profession of optometry, despite, you know, a lot of optometrists not looking like you? Yeah, I can go with that first. Which, you know what, I will see the floor. Dr. Reynolds. <laughs> Thank you. No, I, you know, I went to University of Florida, graduated 1987, a Gator all the way. And, you know, it's interesting, we bring up our experiences. I, I did really well in high school, graduated top of my class. I was so honored and proud. I thought I was so smart. I went to UF, but I wasn't so smart. I didn't know a class of 300. I was one of the first in my family to go off to uh, college. And it was all about being a pediatrician, giving back, and it just didn't work out that way. Maybe it's, you know, it wasn't for me. And then I thought about eye care. I've always worn glasses. My aunt has diabetes. Uh, she lost her vision to diabetes. So I was personally connected to uh, an experience of vision loss. And I couldn't understand why she lost her vision. She was going to the eye doctor. How could she lose her vision if she's going to the eye doctor? And so back in those days, um, Adam and Daryl, we didn't have social media. We didn't have internet. I remember you got mail. You know, so we couldn't research the profession like the students do now and know more about it. So I was like, okay, I could do dental. I, no, I'm not going in anyone's mouth. I could do feet, podiatry. No, of course not touching it, not touching feet. And then I, again, the eyes and my aunt and I researched and I looked up schools and I applied and I was fortunate enough to get into Southeastern at the time it was known as before it merged with Nova Southeastern. But my passion for um, giving back and caring is what drove me. And I think that's what drives a lot of the students who are interested in this profession. I know we have to increase awareness about this profession. It, as Adam said, we have to start early, get the pipeline, get the students interested in optometry uh, and, and, and letting them know that this is a great profession that Optometry gives us life and that you save lives. You not just only save eyesight, you save lives. And, and that's what's critically important. And that's what really spearheaded me into optometry school. And you know, my, when I got accepted in, I, the racism, the challenge in those days, the failing because you're, I think because we were black, the challenges at Southeastern at the time, they were real. And um, my sister was going to the law school at the time and the two of us just kept each other up. My mom prayed quite a bit. Um, taking the national board was a challenge, but I was determined because I wanted to give back. And again, I say this and I say it's over because mentorship really is critically important. I can't stress it enough. If you, as Adam said, and everyone on the panel said, if you know someone that looks like you, that's an optometrist, you're more inclined. Once Dr. Ingraham got to the program, that's how I was introduced to the NOA. These dynamic young men and women had their meeting in Fort Lauderdale at that time. I think it was 93 or 94, I can't remember, long time ago in Fort Lauderdale. And it was the first time I was around a group of black optometrists. I've never really been around black eye doctors. I've never really, besides Dr. Ingraham, I never really seen another black eye doctor. My eye doctor was not black. And so it was great to be part of that network um, and meeting those men and women and knowing that I wasn't the only one. And more importantly, that I'm giving back. So that's what kept me in this profession. That was that is what keeps me now in this profession, that I'm giving back and making sure that the next generation of talented young black individuals have an opportunity as well through mentorship, through the NOA, through our scholarship programs. And um, that they can graduate and get back to their community. We keep talking about the numbers. The numbers don't lie. African Americans are going blind disproportionately. And Daryl brought it up. It's, it's cultural competency care. You know, these patients, they come in and they're like, oh, that doctor told me I had a coma. Well, what's a coma? You know, you, so you have to explain to them their eye disease and what's going on. Now, I'm not using that drop, that drop too expensive. And you gotta really explain to them they're gonna go blind from this disease or diabetes. It's not a touch of sugar. It's not a touch of sugar. You gotta to explain to them their disease process and make them understand because they're the ones that are going blind from this disease. So that passion for me is what drives me to continue to be the optometrist that I am today. So for myself, um, just like Andre, I am of West Indian background. And I think if you have immigrant parents, which I'm sure a lot of people do, the pipeline to prosperity is through education. So education is always something that, you know, it's not, am I going to go to school and then postgraduate? It was, which school was I going to go to? 
So <laughs> I decided I went to University of Toronto and I actually got a degree in genetics thinking I was going to do research. But I realized it wasn't really so into interacting with cells as I was into interacting with people. And so literally I took myself to the career center and did a little career quiz. And the first thing that popped up, opto maybe you should be an optometrist. And I searched and I found a black optometrist in Toronto. So I was studying at the University of Toronto and I shadowed her and she was just incredible. She treated the mayor like she was just, she was a boss and I wanted to be that person. And, you know, behind that was the fact that every single one of my aunts and my uncles, and I have 10 who are um, direct members of my, my mother's family, have glaucoma, you know? So I felt a personal, personal passion. I felt connected to doing this type of work. And I'm ever grateful to doing this type of work. Um, I do want to touch upon, I think it was mentioned, the cultural competence and the importance of instilling that in our students and our residents. As somebody who helped select residents with my amazing partners, Dr. Crane, Dr. Cater, and Dr. Ellis, I try to insert questions about cultural competence into the interview. The reason being, in your, when you're treating people in the South Bronx, we are so fortunate to have such a rich population to learn from. As healthcare professionals, we learn from minority populations. We learn most from them because a lot of the time they're very disadvantaged. But as much as they respect you, you have to respect them. So it's trying to make sure that you have people who will be able to provide that care. And that comes right from, right from the beginning, right? Right from the selection process. So anybody else when it comes to how they got into it? Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to chime in again on, I was born in Trinidad. I was not born in the U S. So when I grew up, when I grew up, everybody was black. There is no racism really in Trinidad because everybody black. So, you know, you don't have that issue. Now I come to the United States and I never saw a black optometrist in the U S. The first time I saw a black optometrist was at SEO in Memphis. So I didn't, you know, I didn't stop and say, oh, I need to see it to become it because growing up in Trinidad, everybody was black. So that wasn't even my thought in my head that that was my limitation. And I bring this up to say that we have all these island people that are talking on the panel, people from Canada talking on the panel, right? The two SUNY people have connections to Canada. What I would say to these schools that are listening and writing in this chat is where are you attracting students? Canada and the Caribbean seem to have a lot of people that uh, have no problem with uh, excelling at school and have no problem with uh, having issues in that. So I would say the, the issue is you're not looking in the right place. You got to look where they are. If you go to Kansas and say, oh, we recruit in Kansas all the time and we don't see any black students and none of them come to my school. Well, you haven't talked in front of enough black people. You know, it, 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 it's, it's an issue of you have to look and you have to go where they are. You have to look and see where the problem is. You know, I, I, didn't, I didn't have that and I didn't see that. I love the business of optometry. I love helping people. I love making that immediate impact. And I remember just sitting there as a, as a student, I, I wore glasses my whole life and I never even considered eye care. Um, it wasn't even something that was, was brought to me. I've been to the eye doctor all the time. Nobody ever asked me to shadow. Nobody ever asked me about what my career is, what I want to do. It was, here go your glasses and go. And the doctor that I, I, I went to was a very prominent, he's on the sea speaking tour. Um, and it's, it wasn't even something that was considered and that was brought up. So I make it a personal mission of mine that every student that sits in my chair, I ask them that. I turn it around to where now all of a sudden, hey, before you leave, you know we're talking about college. You know we're talking about careers. And then parents bring their kids into my office and they hear from other parents that Dr. Ramsey is going to drill them about this, that, and the other. And I got kids in my office all the time that ain't got no vision problems. She said, I didn't care. If, she don't need glasses. I know you don't need glasses. But I need you to talk to him about his algebra. Sit him down right over here about this. And that's where, we, you know, we have to make the, the push. And I know a lot of African-American and Black doctors are doing that. The issue is I, I, I have a minus six prescription. I've been going to the eye doctor since I was born. Not one of them ever talked to me about school, college, careers, what I care about, would you like to shadow me, 
it, it was never even introduced. So in my mind, it wasn't even something that I considered. And that's where we have to we have to look at how the profession is doing and realize that it's not just on the black people. And that's the hard part is that we're having a panel asking black people about the problem. And the issue is, it's not only black people's fault and way to solve it. Non-minorities have to say, I have a part in this too. I, ha I play a small part in this. And, I, and, and I, I say that to say, when this, you know, all, all the uptick came up uh, with the George Floyd situation, I saw the ophthalmology group, National Medical Association, put out a statement. And it showed that we are, we are against the police using rubber bullets because three people have lost an eye due to rubber bullets, right? And one of the people that lost an eye used to be an employee of mine. So I asked somebody in a board, big up, a big time board, and I said, hey, how come ophthalmology has a statement about this and this board does not have a statement? The response I got from board member of one of these organizations was, maybe she should have been wearing polycarbonate lenses. That is the response that we got from a non-minority on a board with no minorities when I said, hey, how come the ophthalmologists are putting out a statement about people losing an eye when they're peacefully protesting? Maybe eye doctors should say to the public at large, hey guys, people are losing an eye for no reason. They're peacefully protesting. Let them know that using rubber bullets hits in the face and it'll cause a problem. And their response to me was, ha ha, maybe we should make them wear polycarbonate lenses. So that's why I, I wanna stress a point that we have issues in our own profession. We gotta clean up our own house too. And the people that are saying, the person that said this to me, I know personally, I went to dinner with numerous times. So it's not somebody that is racist. It's not somebody that would not not have a problem. It's somebody that just does not understand cultural competency, does not understand inclusion, does not understand that that's not funny, does not understand you gotta show up at the cookout too. You can't just ask me, Dr. Ramsey, to come when we have black things. I gotta come and answer for all the black people across the world, but I need you to show up too when it's time to show up and you're on the position, because I'm not on that board, so you're on that board. So when you're on that board and minorities are bringing something to you that's a problem, you have to also understand that, hey, just because it's not a problem for me doesn't mean it's not a problem. It's, it's all of our issues. And, and, and that's where I care needs to understand that what's going on in the streets and what's going on out there is happening here. It's happening in our boardrooms. It's happening in, in our exam lanes. We have problems in eye care. We need to self-reflect and look and say, how can I make a change in my office, in my board, in my community? How can I stand up when people are making text messages and, text messages and jokes that are not funny? You know, where, where is my accountability and not saying to the black people on this panel that we have to fix everything. It's not only on us, it's on the other ones too to be accountable and say, I have not done enough this year and I will make a personal accountability to do more. Adam, you, you bring up a great point. I know we've been on kind of like a media run with Black Eye Care Perspective and doing various things. But one question that I always ask whenever we're being interviewed especially if it's by someone that's a non-minority, I always ask them straight up, um, how many black students have you allowed to shadow you? And to this point, I have not had one person to give me a response of one. And when you think about that, that's very sad that you have not had a black student shadow you in optometry to show them how great this profession is. We have to do a better job. Like Adam said, we have to clean up our, um, our profession. Our profession is great. We, we work with the, the most precious vision known to mankind. Uh, we're able to, you know, prescribe from the chair and have a retail aspect and a medical aspect. There's no other profession out there that can do it. And we're the gatekeepers into the healthcare system. So, you know, we are that spark. If we can do this in the eye care system, just imagine the wave that will start or that the, the trend that will start in the entire healthcare system. So we can, we can really change the game. Um, in regards to my experience when it came to figuring out optometry, uh, kind of similar to other folks, my mother's from West Africa, Liberia. Um, I was raised in the States, and my dad's from Detroit. Uh, I'm talking about Detroit, Detroit, if you know what I'm talking about. So my whole life, my parents have always, um, you know, been there and educated and said education's number one, number one, number one, number one. They just beat it in your head. 
Um, and my mother always told me, you know, she really pushed, you just have to have empathy, treat people well, um, whatever job you do, make sure you treat them like you treat me, meaning her. Um, so for me, I don't have a, you know, I was seeing a doctor and then I jumped into optometry. For me, it was more when I was in uh, 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 NC State, my undergrad, I needed a job. And I went and I applied to work as an eyewear consultant. And I just fell in love with when someone put their first gla when their glasses on for the first time and the smile that they had on their face and how fly they felt that they looked. And at that point, I was like, you know what? I want to be the one that's going to actually write the prescription. And from there, I became an optometrist and I've been rocking and rolling ever since. Now, on my path to becoming an optometrist, I had the opportunity of seeing a black optometrist, a great black optometrist, just like many others out there. And his name was Dr. Artis Beatty. And he was at Eye Care Associates, and now he's the chief medical officer of my eye doctor. And Dr. Beatty has played the role of my mentor over time. And to be able to have someone that is sitting in that position, to be able to give me wisdom and guidance and tell me certain books to read and uh, which rooms I should be in and things of that nature is priceless. So again, circling back to what everyone's saying in regards to mentorship, it goes a long way. Uh, but that's just my two cents in regards to my background and how I got into the uh, uh, eye care world. I mean, it might be an uncomfortable statistic, but 75, there was a study in 2014 that said 75% of white people don't have any non, like people of color friends or don't have anybody in their sphere of influence who are non-Black. I mean, look within your own sphere of influence, right? The reason that you have that mentor is because you had that connection. You need those connections. You need those connections across many cultures. So if we don't have those connections, how are we going to move up? You know, this is it's such a multi-layered problem that is going to have a multi-layered solution of which we all are a part, exactly like what Adam was saying. It's not us who's going to solve this. You know, can we be part of this? Absolutely. But it's everybody. And people should feel just as responsible and passionate about this as we on this panel do. And Joy, you know what else? The one thing I would challenge the folks here at SUNY, we don't need a bunch of Black people on this call next time for solutions. Let's get some <laughs> other folks of power in here so we can get our point across and so they can understand the solutions that we have. Because we can, again, talk until we're blue in the face, but until the folks that are sitting at the table that's up above want to have us sit at the table with them and talk about the solutions to make eye care great, you know, we're not going to be able to accomplish anything. We have to work together. And it's not just about, you know, uh, Dr. Adam Ramsey always says this, it's not all about just throwing money at the situation. You know, we don't want hush money. We want a commitment over 5, 10, 15, 20 years until the problem is solved. And we want you guys to not only, you know, help out financially, but also we want you to use your influence to impact your colleagues at that table. That way we can truly make a change. So, so I think one important thing is to consider. So we're talking about optometry and optometry schools and the responsibility of optometry programs and what we can do. I think that's really important that we do what we can within the profession. But I think we also have to acknowledge the systemic issues that exist also. Um, the chronic underfunding of a lot of our schools, um, elementary schools, high schools, um, which impact, it directly impacts the, the product, the students that are coming from many of these communities. If you look at many of the black and, and brown communities throughout, throughout the U.S. And, and also throughout Canada, you find that the schools themselves aren't equivalent, right? So you, you start off from, a, from, a, from a, an area where it's more challenging for many of these students to rise up and then become optometrists, for instance. So as much as there needs to be an emphasis on the schools um, taking more responsibility for recruitment and encouraging black students to, to matriculate into optometry schools, I think it's also very important that the system, <laughs> and I think that many aspects of, of society now it's working or they're mentioning that they're working on these, these problems, but I think it's important that there's a systemic approach to this as well too, right? We, we understand this issue is, although we're talking about within optometry, it's much bigger than just optometry. It also needs to be rectified. It also needs to be discussed um, as well. Um, so I agree. I just want to, uh, that is exactly it. it. It's optometry, but it's greater than optometry. You know, I mentor high school kids, and one of the things we talked about in, in, uh, in our mentorship awareness or mentorship campaign is sometimes you got to start earlier. To really introduce optometry in elementary school and the, the science, the STEM programs that these kids are in to get them interested and the funding. And, and I know we're talking about funding. The lack of funding is real. It's a systemic problem that we have to just fight against and continue to fight against and, and make sure that we get that pipeline of students 
And I, I challenge everyone on this call that's listening to this podcast or to this webinar that it's all of us that's part of the solution. I agree with what Daryl said. All of us are part of the solution. Like I said, you can be a mentor by having that young patient come in with a minus six, like, uh, like uh, Adam Ramsey, <laughs> or any prescription, and, and encourage them to go into the healthcare field, become an optometrist. It starts so young to plant that seed of wanting to be that optometrist, especially nowadays with all the challenges that kids, you know, I have two young kids. And uh, I will tell you, Daryl, my daughter is 19. My son is uh, a, kn a knucklehead 16. And I'm having a hard time getting those two individuals interested in optometry. I know some of us as optometrists are having a hard time. My son wants to be a social influencer. That's what his challenge, he says he's gonna make more money being a social influencer than going to optometry school, Adam. So it's getting them interested, aware of optometry school, but not just optometry as a profession, but what this profession can do and be. Again, we save more than just sight. We save lives. Yeah. And that's my mantra when I talk about it. So um, it's going to take all of us listening tonight to be that mentor for the next generation of talented young optometrists. Dr. Reynolds, send them my way. I'll get them right. <laughs> because the wonderful thing about optometry is you can be an optometrist, but you can also be a social influencer and you can profit on both ends. So you can have the best of both worlds. Uh, we just got to make sure we have that right dialogue and show folks that this industry is so wide open. I mean, you have industry, you have uh, corporate optometry, private optometry, research, academia. I mean, like you name it, uh, yeah. media. You know, I mean, there's so many different things that you can do. You just got to find your own way of getting in there and putting your twist, your own vibe to it and uh, make it happen for the most part. You're right. Yeah, it's one of the most diverse populations in terms of, well, diverse professions in terms of what we can do. I mean, when I entered optometry school, I don't know that I knew hospital-based optometry and I've been practicing it my entire career now. You know, and the things that I'm doing, I never would have thought I could do just because I may not have had the exposure. So really and truly, it's the exposure, but it starts from the very beginning. You know, as I was doing some research, I heard about this just incredible program called the Mayerhoff Scholars Program that's at the University of Maryland at Baltimore. And what they do is they find promising high school students. And they provide them scholarships between $5,000 and $22,000 a year, internship programs, international opportunities. They reach all the way back there and bring them up to the university. And they graduate more MD, PhD, any more Black MD, PhDs than anywhere else in the country because they're starting from the, from the very beginning. You know, and I think that, that it's that type of radical change and radical thought that we need to do in order to attract more people to our profession. Yeah, I, I, um, I remember when I was at SUNY, when I was on faculty at SUNY, I remember interacting with students who were part of the STEP and C-STEP program. So those are programs that bring students from uh, area high schools, like black and, and, um, and people of color from various high schools and also from some of the universities and colleges and that. And I also thought it was interesting to have those conversations with those students, especially them seeing me then being a faculty member at SUNY and having that dialogue I always thought was very important. And throughout the years I was there, I did see students come from that program, then matriculate into some schools and, and graduate. So I think there's some importance of building that relationship. And to what you said, Cheryl, I agree. I've often said, I've been on admissions committees at uh, a couple of universities now. And I think the thing that I always see in, in large part is recruiting students in, at the end of their university career. I think we have to reach out much, much, much sooner. These, children, these students are deciding what they wanna do from before they get into high schools. Have that exposure, having that touch point going farther earlier, I think it's really, really critical. And especially what you mentioned, Joy, starting earlier, building that pipeline, building those connections all the way through is so key. So I'd like to see a lot of the schools, I know we're not talking so much solutions today, but I think it's important for the schools to consider how they can probably ramp that up. Um, this, this step and C-step programs at SUNY is a good idea. I'm not sure how successful it's been, um, but I think other schools adopting similar programs, especially in, 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 in um, environments like in New York or in uh, Michigan, uh, or some environments where you have a lot more people of color and black people in those environments, how do you engage? It's very, it always stood out to me as um, when I was um, at SUNY that we had a very black population. You know, we had many of our patients, kind of what Cheryl mentioned before, that were black, but we had very few students and very few 
um, people in the clinic that looked like them outside of her staff. It was always, so we had to do a much better job. It's, it's really difficult to think that you don't have qualified people, uh, black students living in those communities that you can recruit from as well. So I do think there needs to be, a, needs to be an emphasis, similar to how institutions will go after um, funding, for instance, with that level of vigor, I think it's necessary for the schools to consider going after um, black students and other underrepresented groups with just as much vigor. I think that level of intensity is necessary. Schools will do that to, to, in, to um, ensure their survival, but I think having a diverse student base, is, <laughs> having diverse graduates, it's also a way to ensure your, your, your survival. Ensuring the connectivity when students are going through because of the concern that students will donate to these universities when they graduate. Same thing. Make sure that when these black students are going through, make sure they feel a part of the process. So when they do graduate, again, as we mentioned previously, perhaps they'll become faculty. Perhaps they'll be then part of that mentorship program that can help other students come forward as well, too. So I think all these things should be considered. And in many of these things, it doesn't require much more resources to do. I think it's more just a matter of thinking about it and actually applying and focusing on, on, on what needs to happen. I think that's really critical what you're, what you're saying there, Andre. Um, the, the, the issue I, I, I'm, I'm having is we can talk about why there's no diversity in industry and why there's not diversity of speakers. But at the end of the day, unless we have more students in the pipeline, you can't, I can't get mad at downstream as much as we're here. So at the end of the day, the 23 schools are the where, where we have to focus. Yes, we want to talk about undergrad and, and, and elementary school, but most of the people watching on this call do not run those schools. So I want people to say, work on your house and what you can fix. Don't sit down and say, well, it's because I don't have enough people in high school and because it's elementary school and point the blame everywhere else and not say, hold on, what am I doing in my thing? What I have control over? Because a lot of times, most of the schools are writing off students that are quality students because they do not have this specific GPA and this specific OAT. And you're not realizing that these students are coming from rough areas. And you don't realize that a 2.8 from this student who mom was never home, who uh, parent was not there, is living with their auntie, is sometimes way more qualified because they've been through a lot than somebody that got a 4.2, but they got a tutor and somebody else did all their homework for them and somebody else submitted all their stuff. So their 4.2 isn't as qualified or as quality as this 2.8 that scrapped and scraped to get there. So a lot of times they are disqualifying some quality students. And I've talked to students that applied at one or two schools because these schools are expensive to apply for, the OAT is expensive to take, and then all of a sudden they get brushed off by one school and they get lost. They don't get, because they have, can't reapply to the next year and they're not there. When you don't look at the student as a whole and say, what is bringing in this student? What, kind of, what, what else do they add to the profession? What else do they bring with them? Because yes, they don't meet this mark and they meet that mark, but did you sit down and talk with them? Did you sit down and say, you know what, we want to have more diversity? So you know what we're going to do? We're going to pay special attention and care to these ones. So the second I get one Black applicant, I am going to find a way not to lose them. I am going to find a way to put them in a program. I'm going to find a way to help them build something up. I am going to, as a school, give them an OAT prep course from myself and fund it to go back. We have to realize that the second they get funneled here, if they get on your doorstep, it has to be on the case of every single school to say, if they don't get into my school, Berkeley or UAB or SUNY, I will then go and help them get into another school. Don't just brush them off and say, oh, no, you can't get here. Yes, okay, some, you know, UAB can only hold 40 students, but some other schools like PCL got 200 students, so maybe they can hold another one, you know what I mean? Like, they, it has to be on the onus of the schools and the people that are listening, because we have 400 people watching us right now, and some of those people in those positions say, you know what, I'm not going to let one get lost. I'm not going to leave one behind. And even if they don't get in this year, I'm going to work with that student for 12 months so that next year, if they want to get in, we're going to find a way to get them in. But what's happening right now is those students are getting brushed off. They don't meet the curriculum, so they don't even get to the interview. They don't even get to be able to explain themselves and say, I've been through all of this and my GPA is like this because of this. They're not getting that opportunity and we're losing good qualified applicants that we have to find a way to make room. The, the profession is missing out on great optometrists and uh, we, we can do a lot better. That's Adam, that's, sorry, I'm just, just want to touch on this one, one thing. So I think, fantastic point. I think the idea of um, 
one thing I've often thought about is having benchmarks. So perhaps you have a criteria. So you say your GPA to get into this school is going to, you need to at least have a 3.2. Now it shouldn't really matter so much if somebody has a 3.2 or 4.0. You've met the criteria now for GPA check. What else are you bringing to the table? What are the, what are the, what are the things, what are the characteristics of this person you think will make a great doc, right? So I think it, it needs to go beyond just the OAT. It needs to go beyond the GP, exactly what you're saying. And to your point, this comes up a lot where you have students who potentially to make that 2.8 that you mentioned previously, it's a lot more difficult. And many students in that circumstance would not have done so well. That journey specifically would prepare them much better to be an optometrist or to be in any other healthcare professions. And this is a trend that we see in other healthcare professions. I know here in Canada, many of the medical schools are doing just that. Rather than saying, we're gonna just skim off the top and take those with the highest GPAs. We're gonna have a standard. So here's, you meet that threshold, you're good. Let's see what else you bring into the table and have that conversation. So I, I think there are many strategies that can be used and probably should be used so that we can include many people and build a more diverse um, student base that, which again, what we mentioned, what we've said throughout this program, builds that pipeline and then provides many of the other opportunities that come along with that. And I think that that's critically important because what you're talking about is changing the admittance criteria right. to suit the population that you want to attract. You know, I sat on admissions to interview students at Berkeley, um, and on more than one occasion, we interviewed a student who may have had an alternative pass. And I, I will never forget, I had the most incredible interview. This woman, she, you know, her story was beyond anything that I ever heard. And I said, you know what, this is the best candidate. She's a black woman, a black candidate, incredible story, gripping, she's gonna get in. Did she get in? She did not. She was waitlisted. And it was one, it was the straw that broke my back. So I marched myself to the admissions office and I said, how come this person didn't get in? What's going on? And they said, oh, well, you don't know. You don't know the entire story. Berkeley is a meritocracy. So I think that that's what we need to deconstruct. That meritocracy, how can you have a meritocracy when merit is not, the, the playing field is not level? And you know that student actually ended up getting admitted to SUNY, and it's a crazy story because we were on a call yesterday. She got admitted to SUNY, and then she was accepted off the wait list from Berkeley. And the admissions office actually had her call me and say, "What should I do? Do I stay at SUNY? Should I go to Berkeley?" You know, sorry, SUNY. We grabbed her up, <laughs> and she moved to California and then ended up starting and is, is an incredible optometrist in her own right, having a different story, not having that three point whatever GPA or four point whatever GPA. And she's critical to the profession, just like anybody else who would come from that background. So I just want to share my story because there, uh, Adam, I'm that story. I'm that story. I graduated from UF, challenged, because I told you it was very hard for me at UF, and going from number three in my class to being in a class of 300. And when I applied to Southeastern, numbers are important, but numbers doesn't always matter. I never had any, I never took the oath. I didn't even know back then the Kaplan test. There's no internet to study. And so I graduated UF, I'll share with everybody, with a 2.9 GPA. I took the oath the first time, I did okay, but I could have done better. But I was led into optometry school and I'm here today. I didn't fail anything. So it's not the numbers that's on in the chair that's interviewing, it's that person. And I wish we could go back to that where it's just a blind interview and you just interview that person. Because a lot of us here tonight probably may have been that way, I don't know. But a lot of graduates in the past, these summer programs, that uh, you talked about Dr. Horn at PCO, even Dr. Marshall at ICO. A lot of these summer programs had students that probably didn't have the best, biggest top GPA, but they were dedicated and willing to work hard. And these are the optometrists that we celebrate now. I think some of the optometrists in the very beginning who graduated like Dr. Robert, Dr. Poston, Dr. C. Clayton Powell, they worked hard. They may not have had the top GPA, maybe they did, but they worked hard and they contributed so much to this profession. I've always said, I've sat on the admissions for Nova Southeastern for a while. I know we have a pre-optometry program, but I've always been a proponent of, it's not the numbers 
You know, we, you know, part of the challenge right now is everyone's looking at the numbers. So this person won't succeed if they don't meet this min, this GPA. No, it's exactly what Adam said. Is that person's experience? what they had to come through, the challenges that they had to overcome. They may have come from a single parent household. Challenges of that person, but their dedication and their interviews really what makes the difference. So, you know, I've known students who didn't get into NOVA, but went to other schools and are practicing optometrists now. So I've been a big proponent of not looking just straight at the numbers. I know some schools that do, and I know that some schools now are not just looking at OAT numbers. Some schools, I think when we had our discussion on Sunday, some of the deans were on that. Uh, 19 out of 23 schools are looking at GRE, uh, MCAT, if the students take MCAT and change and decide they wanna be an optometrist, as well as the OATS. And we also know, everybody on this panel and everyone that's in the audience know that African-Americans typically do not do well on standardized tests. Various studies have proven that over and over and over and over again. So there's always those challenges in just taking standardized tests. That's a challenge for black students. So it's that student in your chair. And again, starting early, having that relationship, I challenge all the schools administrators that's on here or persons from the schools to start early, to go out there. Like I think Andre said that where his school was, it's just like Nova. Southeastern, we're surrounded by a very diverse population, you know, and having those interaction with the high school and those middle schools and introducing the profession, that's critically important. And that's where your money should be on helping those students understand what the profession is all about. And then not just helping those students, but cultivating a relationship. Because even in, with our HBCUs, you have to cultivate that relationship with those students and with those schools to really get those uh, uh, young, bright students interested in optometry because I'm telling you, medicine is right there trying to get them into medical schools and other professions right away. So it's not just, oh, this is optometry. This is what optometry does. It's that relationship. It's building that relationship. And one of the things that the NLA has done, and I know Daryl and, and Adam have done a program too with HBCUs that we've partnered with uh, the Poston family. And let me tell you who Dr. Poston is. A lot of people don't know. He's the first black graduate of UC Berkeley. But he wasn't just the first black graduate of UC Berkeley. He formed a, 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 a company called VSP. He was one of the co-founders of VSP, a multi-million dollar company right now. And we're so fortunate to partner with his family and the Poston Foundation to have our HBCU initiative. We were just able to give three HBCU uh, grads from Hampton University, $1,000 to get into optometry school, to take the oaths and to try to matriculate to optometry school, but not just get them there, to support them as they go through because that's also needed. It's not just getting them in the pipeline, but we need that critical support and everyone on this phone call, everyone on this webinar is critical to that support. The schools are critical, but every, every optometrist is critical as far as being a mentor, a support for those students. As Adam said, I'll, you're part of the solution for this problem. Dr. Reynolds, I wanted to just, you know, just add to your story. You know, when I applied to PCO, I didn't have the best GPA. My OAT sucked, you know, and um, they said they felt like I, I couldn't, you know, handle the program. So again, going back to Dean Horn, I was invited to the summer enrichment program and when I did that program, I did amazing. And you're like, man, this guy has it. And you know, it's these, these outside factors as you guys have touched on, Dr. Ramsey, Dr. Reynolds. I've been working since I was 14, you know, legally, right? Prior to that, I was in the barbershop sweeping up hair and making flyers and things like that um, at an earlier age. So my entire life, I've been working. And when you're working full time, when you're in college, and you're trying to take tests and study for your tests, yeah, you're not going to do the best on these things because you got other factors in your life that you have to take care of. Um, but when you have that opportunity and you don't just look at the numbers and you take out all those barriers, you'll see a lot of success come out of someone because when you have things over your head, such as work, having to take care of family and other things, it can impact you when you take a certain type of test. Um, so I just wanted to add on to that because I'm same background, you know, without the summer enrichment program, uh, no one would have seen uh, uh, what you see here today. Or I wouldn't be on this conversation or this call with you guys today as well. So um, 
shout out to Dean Horn and PCO for uh, having that program. You guys definitely need to bring it back. No, so that, that's, 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 I think that's true of, of a lot of stories that we hear as well. I think one thing so is just to touch back on the faculty piece as well. I want to kind of go back to that a little bit. So we mentioned a lot of the mentors. You guys mentioned Dean Horn and some others from various schools. And I think it's great that the mentors that are there are putting in that work. One of the things that institutions have to recognize is actually the work of these people. I mean, you, if, you, if you're then compared on um, sort of research output, you know, as somebody else, when you put in this work to be mentors to all these students, it has to be recognized uh, by these universities. There has to be a path then for promotion and tenure and so on for these individuals to ensure that you're not having this cultural taxation piece that's happening without then having some um, reward associated with it. So when you do have uh, when you do have faculty that are taking on these roles, I think the universities, it's, it's necessary for the universities to support these individuals in a formal way as well. So that, that can't be lost because you can't have that support if, if the individuals are there and then their merit scores are poorer because they're not necessarily following some of the more traditional lines that exist within the university. So it's important that the universities and the schools um, find a way to ensure that these people doing that type of work are also supported as well. So I wanna make sure that that's, that's mentioned. Another thing that's important, I think, and um, Dr. Reynolds, you mentioned this as well, the economic burden and hardship that comes along with many optometry schools. As we've seen over the last, uh, when I started optometry school, I was paying international tuition. My tuition was somewhere around 16,000. Um, a few years ago, last I checked in, it was closer to 45 or $50,000 a year or something like that, right? Significant increases. Now, many people may not be able to afford that level of tuition. And if they are, if they've been supported by their families or loans, it can be quite stressful going through the program. So I think something else for schools to consider is how can you then provide more financial support for some of these students who are going through, which can then help to ease that financial burden and allow students to focus on the education piece. I mean, it, you have to, as part of a, of, um, of a community and creating a culture that's going to be more inclusive, you can't have these students who are coming through. Just getting in alone isn't enough. You have to provide that support to those students. And again, I reiterate, you also have to provide the support to students who are that, or, or to faculty who are supporting those students as well. I'll jump in. I think there's also that inclusion piece that's important because once you let those students in, I had a friend who was telling me today about, there is a, this culture of black students repeating years of optometry school. It's a culture that happens, I think, at every single optometry school. And he told me some harrowing stories about how his mother and grandmother passed away in his first year. His mother and his grandmother, the closest people to him, passed away. And he did not have critical support at that SUNY level in order to move forward. But they did bring him in to say, you know what, maybe you should take a leave of absence. So it wasn't support, it was, maybe you should take a leave of absence to deal with whatever you need to deal with. How do you do that? You know, how, how do you sit at home and you cry? How do you do that when you're, when you're here by yourself and you've lost the closest people to you? And that touches upon the critical importance of support as you're going through the program. If you don't have that support, how do you succeed? So as I was saying, and everyone you know, has been saying before, it's a multi-level problem with multi-level solutions that critically includes supporting the faculty, the students, the staff, everybody who makes up the tapestry of an optometric professional program. Yeah, I, I agree, Joy. And, and I think another thing that, that can be done, even without, um, uh, without having full-time faculty, let's say, you know, some people that were inferential to me at, at SUNY was Tanya Carter, who was, uh, was, uh, was an adjunct, right? So she wasn't there every day necessarily but it's somebody who I can chat with about many of these issues that we're discussing today. So it's not, it's not perhaps necessary. It's great to have full-time faculty, but I think where we can have representation is really important. So, uh, you know, the schools can look to leverage much of this. And to what you mentioned, Joy, in those, in those instances, you can, that student perhaps can have more people that they can chat with, more people that can be advocates for them as well and support them through this process. Uh, but you have to have that comfort level and understand that when, you, when you're reporting this, you want it to be, make sure it's received in a way um, that you, that's going to be empathetic um, and it's going to be personal to your, to your, um, to your situation. Now, I, I know we're almost uh, finished with our, our, our time here. And before I get off here and we, before we finish, I, I wanted to mention one thing because most of the people watching us right now are not African-Americans. 
And most of them are saying, what can I do? Or what am I supposed to do? I don't know what I am supposed to do. I'm not black. I didn't understand. This is the first time I'm hearing about this. I didn't mean it. I don't understand. Understand, we get that. That's why we're bringing the information out and we're saying that everybody, now we had over 400 people tune in and then people are gonna watch later, you've heard. Now the question is, what are you gonna do? Are you gonna say something? Are you gonna ask and write a letter and an email to the board of AOA and your state boards and ASCO and say, hey guys, I don't see any diversity. Are you gonna reach out to companies that you support and say, hey guys, where is the diversity? Because what these boards and these companies are saying is that, well, nobody said anything. I didn't think it was a problem. You know what I mean? When you go look and I look at the ASCO board, it's full of the deans of schools. So what they're gonna say is, well, we don't have any black deans, so we don't have anybody black on our board. It's not our fault. Well, hold on, hold on. You need to go reach out to these schools and say, why don't you not have a black dean at your school? We have a lot of accomplished uh, African-Americans that can fill that spot. Why don't you have an at-large member so that you do have some diversity? Because if you can't get them to have diversity there, your organization can force diversity the way you want. All the other professions, medicine, pharmacy, dentistry, has an HBCU uh, school. So why aren't the schools pushing to say, where is the, the black college for optometrists? You know what? And then what they're going to say is, well, we did a task force and the task force determined that we didn't need any more optometry schools. And you know what happened after that, that, that final summary came out? Y'all opened two more schools. So after you said there was no more need for schools, so we don't need to get a black school, you decided to go open two more schools and allow that to be accredited. So you can't tell me that it is about a task force and it's a committee and a survey and it's whatever. No, there was a need and you guys saw the need and it was made. So everybody that is watching that is on here that stayed the whole two hours, which I commend you for sitting up here and staying the two, two hours, say, take a personal responsibility and say, I'm gonna send an email and I am gonna write a letter and I'm gonna make a phone call so that these companies, these organizations and these schools can realize that not just black people want diversity. Everybody wants diversity. Because if you put the pressure only on the 1.8% to make noise for 100%, it's not gonna sound that loud. But if all people stand up and say, you know what? I would love to have more diversity around this table. I wanna see more black and brown. I wanna see more women. I wanna see more everything around this table that's when the, the change is going to happen. So for everybody watching, I ask you and I implore you to make a call, to write an email, to stand up and say something because you, you, you know right now. So if you, after this call, do not send an email, do not write a call. When they come into your office, you don't say, hey guys, um, you want me to pay dues to your organization, but it doesn't seem like you guys are very diverse. You guys are not part of the solution. Taxation without representation doesn't work. So you ask me for thousands of dollars every month, but it does not seem like you value me very much. Thousands of dollars I pay you every year, yet when I needed you, you don't show up to the cookout. But then if, I, if my credit card doesn't work, you call me right away. But now I'm asking you, hey guys, we need some more diversity. When are you gonna re reach out? When are you gonna find? So I'm asking everybody on here, do your part, say something, stand up and say, not on my watch anymore. I am going to be a part of the solution. I'm not gonna be a bystander. I'm not gonna say that I did not know and it's not my problem. It is everybody's problem to fix and solve. And I don't, we, black people on this panel do not wanna talk about this. I can tell you that right now, we have other things to do with our life. We do not wanna talk about this. We would like this to be the first and last panel that we have to come up here and talk about our issues. We want this to be over and done with, and we can talk about diabetes and glaucoma and everything else that we would like to do with our day. But until it stands up and we decide to make a difference, we're gonna stand up here and we will do what we have to do until everybody else, all 333 people that are watching right now, decide that it is my problem too, and it is not just the black people problem, it is a human and humanity problem that we have in eye care that has to be fixed. And Adam, the other thing is, for those that even got a little lost in the sauce of this whole conversation tonight, 
if you don't even know how to make the first step, go to blackeyecareperspective.com. Look at that 13% promise. That's a good way to get started in the industry. When you, communi when you communicate with these companies or these schools or these uh, whoever it may be out there, look at that 13% promise and send that message into that email and make a difference because we are going to hold the industry accountable. We are going to make a change. As I mentioned earlier in this program, by 2050, you know, the non-minority is going to be the minority at some point. So we have to do better. And in order to do better, we have to work together to make this something. So, you know, reach out to us, Black Eye Care Perspective, look at a 13% promise, and uh, thank you guys. And I just want to say, as we're reaching out to Black Eye Care Perspective, don't forget NOA. <laughs> <laughs> right? I'm telling you, 50 years and older, these NOSA students, all of you guys that went to school are all NOSA students. We have fought this fight. There's a good fight, and we're still having to fight. So go on to the NOA website. Be part of the NOA. We're still part of the fight, and we'll, we'll continue to fight to make sure that Black students are equally represented in school and colleges of optometry. 50 years and going strong. So and you, you don't have to be Black to be in the NOA. So everybody can pay dues and support That's true. because That's true. I, I pay all my dues to AOA and I pay like $4,000 a year to be in there. So it's $350 yes. and I pay yes. my dues to be in the NOA. And yes. if you want to say you stand up and support diversity, I want to see 329 people that are still listening to me right now, go pay your 350, support the NOA so that they can do the mission exactly. and the work with the funding. You do not have to be black. Do not have to be a minority to support an organization because I'm a part of a few organizations that don't support me. So you can go out and you can do it right now as I'm talking before you have this call. And for all these big corporate companies out there, you know, uh, the, the My Doctors, the America's Best or whatever it may be, a lot of you guys pay for our AOA membership, right? Do the same thing with the NOA. For all your black doctors, pay for that organization. There's no reason for you not to. I know you got the money. <laughs> so let's make it happen. <laughs> um, I just want to say thank you to SUNY again uh, for opening this discussion. Thank you to Adam and Daryl and, and, and Andre and Joy. This is discussion is so necessary, so needed. It was a hard discussion to have, but it's a discussion to have because as Adam and um, you know, Daryl said this longstanding pandemic of racism, hatred, and bigotry has never, it has not left. And with the untimely and sad death of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Aubrey, and all those young men and women that are dying senselessly, just a painful reminder that we still have this fight and we have a long way to go. So we're going to continue to move forward, continue to fight to make sure we address uh, this issue. So thank you. And I also think it's important to note that optometry is the profession of progress. It's been a profession almost more than any other healthcare profession. We've progressed from being able to dilate our patients, from getting all of these other abilities and increasing our scope almost more than any other profession. So if we can do all of that, we can do this. It's not like we don't have the intelligence. It's not like we don't have the information. Um, there's nothing we don't have. If we don't get this done, it's because we didn't try. And we are committed to trying. Um, I will say, you know, I know this is not CE, but I am always a teacher. So I did create a small reading list that I will provide to the panelists of some of the information and some of the data, because we may not have gotten your hearts, but we will definitely get your minds, because this is something that is important to all of us. So I will reach out and I will send that to you. And I hope that this is in some way made you interested and lit a fire under you to get this vital work done. Thank you, Joy. Um, anybody else have any, any final words they'd like to leave the, the audience, the discussion here? Um, any, anything else you'd like to say? Thank you so much for mentioning participation in the NOA. That was actually one of the Q&A questions was about that was, are you accepting uh, white allies? Are you accepting, do you, or do you encourage participation just with um, blacks and, and minorities. We, 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 you know, I'm so like um, encouraged when I see the protest. The protest is a rainbow of everyone supporting. You know, the civil rights was also a support from various uh, individuals, Jews, whites, you know, what uh, Adam said, it's a humanity issue. 
So we look forward to any allies that will partner with us to move the needle on this discussion. So anyone who can join, will, can join. We thank you for your allyship because that's really the start of the next part of this conversation and solution, allyship, and where we can strengthen that and where we can take that and, and grow with that. So yes. Yeah. And I so think if you're, I was gonna mention if you're on this call now, then everyone like they have been saying, should go join the National Optometric Association right now. Thank you. Um, yeah, the, and, and this obviously was just the beginning. You know, the, the goal of tonight, which I hope we succeeded in, was in sharing and amplifying um, your stories, sharing and amplifying the issues and the problems of, of racial disparities in the eye care industry, in optometry, in schools and colleges, of optometry and faculty and so forth. And, um, and you know, I'll speak for SUNY, we, we definitely want to, to be part of the solution. And we hope that this was one small part in that. And uh, you know, we, we do plan a second part. We plan to do this again in some way, shape or form. We haven't, you know, we wanted to see how this one went to, to determine, you know, what the next step should be. And that's when we're gonna discuss um, solutions and, and how we can all be a part of, of the solution. And, um, and so we look forward to continuing uh, with the next steps. So um, I, I thank you so much to all of the amazing panelists that we had today. I mean, it really, it was incredible hearing, hearing from you and hearing your perspective. So thank you for being here. This is Betsy over here. I don't have my video on, but um, I want to say uh, another thank you a million times to all of our panelists and SUNY for putting this program. It was an honor to have each and one of you be part of this program. Um, I do want to make a few things. I know we didn't get to the q and I would have loved to. It, there was a a lot of questions, which just says that uh, people do want to learn more. I'm not sure if anyone wants to look at them and either answer them to me. I'll send them to the pan to the attendees. Uh, Dr. Harewood, I know a few people are asking, can they get the list of the reading list? So if you want to send that over to me, I'll make sure that I include it along with this video. Um, oh, thank you. Um, but again, I think this is a very important. Uh, long overdue webinar we needed to have and I look forward to having the next one which will be soon. We'll announce the date very soon. Um, we're going to try to put this as well as with the questions that came about today uh, for the future program. So if anyone else has anything to say or wants to address any of the comments or uh, questions in the box, feel free to do so. All right, so we have nothing else to say. I think we can end it now. Um, have a good night. This was great. We had over 400 people on here as well as on Facebook. So we've reached on, as for my numbers, they're, they're in the high numbers, so I'll have an update. Oh, Dr. Heath, did you wanna say something? Yeah, Betsy, if I, if I could just jump in for a moment. I, yeah. I do wanna really thank the panelists. This has been an incredible session. Um, and I do hope that as we start to talk about solutions, um, many of your comments tonight get translated into that session as well. I'd like to just note a couple of points, um, you know, thoughts that I had. And, and one is actually, uh, Dr. Harwood really talked about the fact that the solution is a tapestry. Um, the solution cannot be um, black optometrists um, carrying uh, <clears throat> all the weight in, in moving it forward. It's, it's got to be a, a community-wide uh, effort. Uh, and, and one of the things that we're looking at at SUNY, and, and somebody had mentioned, you know, we've started a President's Task Force on, on race and equity. Um, but it's really designed to look at the tapestry. Um, I really think that the comfort level of students while they're in optometry school is absolutely essential to, to addressing this problem, moving it forward. Um, successful, comfortable, happy students um, are our best uh, evidence of success. You know, and, and so when you think about solutions, I'm, I'm looking for solutions that are community-wide. It's not just about students and, and recruitment. Um, it's not just about black faculty, although we need black faculty desperately. It's not just about black faculty being mentors 
to black students. Um, it's about having communities um, that everyone is a mentor um, and everybody is willing to support and assist. And somebody earlier in the process asked about, you know, um, how to develop mentors who may not look like me. So, you know, I do think that this is, is, is such a complex, multifaceted challenge um, that we really have to follow all the threads of the, of the tapestry um, if we're really going to make a change. So listen, thank you all. This has been absolutely a fabulous session and I'm really looking forward to the next one. Thank you all so much for being here this evening. We look forward to part two. And as Betsy said, um, please look out for an email for that. Other than that, we hope you all have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Have a good night. Thank you all.